Allison, and I'm actually currently a PhD student. I just completed my one year confirmation, so I'm kind of in for the long run now. Um, <laughs> and today I really want to talk to you about unpacking the ins and outs of how cells navigate our DNA, or this long stretch of DNA, in order to make um, pit stops at different areas that the cell requires its function. So to kind of to begin with, we actually have to first address, well, what is DNA? So DNA, it encodes all the genetic information, or all the genes that our cell actually requires or um, to make all the multiple different cells we have in our body. And so the process that does this in terms of that your DNA, it actually becomes this kind of messenger in terms of an RNA, and then it finally the RNA gets transformed into something called a protein. And so as a protein, these are the actual aspects of the DNA that has that particular function. So the main point you need to take away from this slide is that your DNA or your genes in your DNA gets expressed to form a protein, and this protein gives that cell that particular function. So where we actually find our DNA in our cell, well, here we have our animal cell, and there's actual, actually a lot of different components within, that, within our cell. And so the one that we're interested in is actually in the nucleus. So pretty much the nucleus to us, it's an area in the, um, in the animal cell that actually contains all our genetic information. And so the nucleus is actually a really remarkable thing because we have two meters in um, length of DNA and it actually fits inside um, a six micron across area. And some random facts about DNA, because it's pretty cool, is that it would take a person typing 60 words a minute, eight hours a day, and around 50 years to type out the entire human genome. And if we actually unravel all the um, DNA in all of our cells in our body, it actually, we could get it to the moon. So what I want to begin to talk about is actually we need to be able to fit all of our nucleus inside our cells. So there's actually a lot of issues with this. And initially, we have to be able to get these two meters into a tiny area. But then once it's actually in that area, we need to be able to access the information that we want without getting, having to go through the whole uh, DNA itself. So the way we do this is we actually have to package the nucleus very carefully. And so this is kind of a bit of a scary slide, but I'm going to talk you through it, and that the way the DNA is actually packaged, it's actually done in multiple different layers. And the different layers, they have different functions, and they pretty much act to condense down this two meters of DNA into a very small area. So I'll walk you through it. And so initially, our DNA, it's wrapped around this protein. And this protein, these DNA protein bundles, that's the first layer in which they actually control whether or not we can access our gene. And then these protein DNA bundles, they actually form these regions that are based on the particular functions of those genes. And then they are further compartmentalized into compartments that then go into these um, territories. And these territories form that spherical structure, which is known as our nucleus. And so what I want you to, did I miss a slide? Yes, I did miss a slide. So, pretty much what you guys might be aware of with how the nucleus looks like is that it forms these chromosome shapes. So these chromosome shapes, they actually only appear when you have cell division. And so when they're in this state, the DNA is actually really condensed down and we actually can't access our genetic information. And so what I mentioned previously, how we actually package our DNA, this allows our DNA to actually appear looking more like this within our nucleus. So we'll just jump forward. And so what I want you guys to actually think about the DNA is I want you to think of it in terms of it's actually like a neighborhood. So within our, um, uh, sorry, nucleus. So within our nucleus, you have our roads, and these roads actually represent our DNA. And then run around these roads, you actually have landscapes, and these landscapes represent those specific functions or those regions that those genes are going to be found in. And then... And then finally, you're going to have different landmarks, and these landmarks are actually representing our genes. So these are the genes that are going to have the particular functions that actually give that cell that distinct cell characteristic. And so our neighbourhood actually has to be organised in a very nice and clear way that we actually can orientate ourselves around it, and we know where to go to get, the, get to go find the places that we want to find. And so I'm going to take a bit of a sidestep and actually introduce you to this concept known as epigenetics. And so in a scientific way, epigenetics refers to changes in gene expression without actually altering the DNA. 
And so epigenetics actually allows us to have multiple different cell types in our body all containing the exact um, the same amount of genetic information. And so one thing which I find really interesting about epigenetics is that it actually controls the access our cells have to that, in, um, that particular gene of interest, and it acts in the way of signposts. So within our neighbourhood, we have different signposts, and these signposts actually can tell us whether or not we can get to particular areas by following our go or our green lights, or whether or not we're actually hindered and we can't access particular areas. So we have to obey that we can't get to those areas. And so these epigenetic um, signs, or these signposts, they're actually really important in terms of understanding how the nucleus works. And so what we want to understand is how this particular epigenetic map, what effect it actually has in terms of our um, cells. So I actually study the immune system, and a really good cell to actually study how these uh, DNA maps actually change is our killer T cells. So these killer T cells, they actually have the ability to recognize and kill virally infected cells, and we want to be able to understand, as a normal questioning for an immunologist, we want to understand what happens in the context of an infection. So to kind of put this in a bit more perspective, I'm just going to move here, is that if when we have an immune cell, it needs to be able to recognise the DNA map and follow the epigenetic signs to get to a distinct location to find those genes. And so in this case, it can be a pharmacy. And so when it finds this particular location in the nucleus, it can actually equip itself with the right medication, and this medication, or the genes, actually allows it to properly clear the infection. So you can imagine that these signposts are actually really important for a um, normal immune response, so that you can imagine that when these things start to go bad, such as we have a poor um, or a weak immune system, or we start to get detours which actually prevent our immune system being able to read the map, the outcome isn't going to be great and we could actually end up in hospital or very unwell. So, what we're kind of interested in is, well, we actually have to be able to read the map. If we know that our map is screwed up and we don't know where to find things, we actually don't know what our cells are being able to do. So this is kind of where my PhD is actually focusing on, and we want to be able to understand the map of our killer T cells in order to work out what happens in, in a normal infection. So the way that I actually study the nucleus is I use this very high-tech and high-powered microscope, and it allows us to shoot a laser directly at our killer T cells, and our killer T cells are actually our DNA and our epigenetic signposts, so those stop-and-go signposts, they're actually fluorescently labelled so that we can eventually detect them and we generate these really pretty images. So to kind of take a step back into a, I guess, it wouldn't quite be a more high-tech, like a high-powered technique, but a simple way of looking at the immune cell is this is an electron microscope of one of our killer T cells. And so what you can see is that the nucleus, this is the periphery of the nucleus, and you can see that within inside the nucleus, that's all of our genetic information. And so you can see that there actually really isn't much to see under this degree of resolution. So you can see there's regions of dense areas, and you have all the, so the, these regions of openings. So pretty much these type of images, the only understanding we get about our DNA map is that we get the outline of the neighbourhood. So by using our laser power, we can actually... In, not just only understand the neighbourhood, but we can actually um, start to build a pathway that we actually need to follow in order to understand where to find the genes that our cells are um, interested in. So here we have two images that I've generated. And on the image on the left, which is in our yellow, this is actually our DNA. So what you can see is that we've got regions of really dense areas where we find our DNA, and we also have regions where they're fairly open. So these regions where you have these dense DNA, that's where they actually begin to get condensed down and you don't have any access to the genes, whereas regions where it's more open, this is where you're going to allow our genes to begin to be expressed. So, and also what you can begin to see in terms of our DNA, it's actually forming these kind of neighbourhoods. So you can see that DNA creates that effect of that roadmap and then in order for a cell to get to the genes that it needs to, it needs to follow this kind of landscape. So if we actually look at the corresponding, this is an image of one of those epigenetic marks I mentioned, and this is actually the equivalent of the GO 
the, um, the Go um, marks. And so what you can see is that these marks tend to actually just form regions or zones where the DNA is going to be accessible. And when we actually combine the two images, you can start to see that regions where you get these dense regions, we actually don't observe any Go epigenetic signposts. And this is kind of important because these regions actually won't be required for that particular cells, to f um, for that cell's functionality. Whereas the regions where we see those um, green or those zones of those um, go epigenetic marks, in terms of our killer cells and in terms of an infection, these genes will be beginning to be expressed, which will help with the clearance of an infection. So now if we actually go on and look at a, um, a stop epigenetic mark, in comparison to our Go epigenetic mark, you can start to see that the DNA here, where it's all really dense and we can't access it, it's further enforced by the addition of all of our stop epigenetic marks. So these kind of indicate, although you can have dense regions of DNA, they also need to be regulated and signposted to the cell so that they know that these are areas where they can't access. But like with all science, it's not as simple as stop and go. And we actually can have these proteins, and, these, and we have particular proteins that they actually reinforce our stop or go signals. And it's a way in, it's another further way in which our cells can um, add additional uh, signposts into the maps that we're generating. And so to add, to add more on from here, we've actually got other epigenetic marks that they can actually represent the different other different signs that we can have in our map. So they're not just stop and go, but they more represent those yellow lights or those giveaways or points at time when you have to actually stop and think before you move. And so these particular marks over here, they actually have a role in temporarily uh, preventing access or allowing access our, um, our cells to particular areas of the nucleus. And so, to kind of begin to tie this all together, for, in order for us to have a proper immune response, our immune cells need to be able to read our DNA map and follow those epigenetic signs to find the genes that they require for the expression. And so this may all seem really simple, but the thing is we want to begin to start to understand how these different epigenetic marks, so our stop and go marks, as well as our yellow, um, our yellow lights and our different um, proteins involved, we want to understand this in a multi-dimensional approach. So the next kind of step that we want to start to do is be able to see this in a three-dimensional way. And then on top of this, although we're getting this nice kind of landscape that we see in our stop and go signs, we also want to know a bit more about the specifics. So we want to be able to see exactly where these particular genes or where they're actually located within the nucleus so we can actually come in and interrogate this and see how it changes during an immune response. So nice and quick, but that's the end. <laughs> Go to nerdnight.com to find a Nerd Night event near you. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentation.